to give this talk, and it's just such a pleasure. I want to just say that um, there's a number of people in the audience who I know uh, who are family members or friends, and, and that's a really special opportunity because usually as a scientist, we only get to talk to other scientists. But it's really fun to have you here and share with you some of the things about my research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to another place and another time. I'm actually going to take you back to um, San Francisco in the early 1980s. And in north of San Francisco, there was this community of houseboat owners. And they were really mad. They were super mad because every night when they went to sleep, a noise would begin. It was a really loud noise, and it kept them up. It wouldn't let them sleep. Their whole houseboat would vibrate. And everybody was really grumpy because you know what it's like not to get any sleep. People get really grumpy. And this is what they heard. It was so loud, and it was all night long. And they'd complain, and they'd complain. And in the morning, when the city officials came to figure out what the noise was, the noise was gone. And this would happen day after day after day after day for months. Had all kinds of crazy ideas of what might be making the noise. They thought maybe it's a giant razor. Someone has a really big, loud, noisy razor, and they're using it right near our houseboats. Another idea was, well, maybe there are swarming bees under our houseboats. They've used the timber, and they're swarming in there, and that's what's making that awful noise. But most people thought it was some kind of motor, and people were pretty sure that it could even be the US Navy on secret drills with submarines right near their houseboats. They had no idea what this sound was, but it was really driving them crazy. Well, what scientists figured out was that it was actually this little fish, a 25 centimeter fish called the plain fin midshipman, Perixes notatus. And it makes this funny humming sound. We call it singing. We now know that they sing. Fantastic. But you might be wondering, why are they doing this crazy thing? Why do fish sing? Why do they hum? Well, they hum to attract females. It's only the males that hum, and they do it so that the girl fish will come and mate with them. OK, that's wonderful. But you might be scratching your head and saying, well, how does a fish sing? It doesn't have a throat or a larynx like we do. What, how does it make that funny sound? I bet you guys can hum really well. These fish can hum for hours and hours and days and months. How do they do it? Well, a really good friend of mine and a colleague from Cornell University, Andy Bass, figured this all out. He realized that these fish have something called a swim bladder. And a swim bladder is usually a white, pillowy looking balloon that's inside a fish. And it helps them with gas exchange and buoyancy so they can go up and down if they fill up their, their, um, their swim bladders. But this fish had a weird and wonderful uh, swim bladder. They had these sonic muscles on their swim bladders. And these sonic muscles would vibrate super, super quickly and produce that beautiful hum that you heard. Andy also figured out that these muscles, these pink things right here, are all muscle, were actually fired up by nerve cells that went right to the back of the brain. Where, where the back of the brain hits your spinal cord is where these special neurons sat and fired down this sonic nerve into the sonic muscle and made it vibrate really, really fast. And even more excitingly, is we now know that this part of the back of the brain, which is known as a vocal center, is actually super conserved, which means that all kinds of organisms have these same neurons and centers which develop into sound, uh, sound centers in the brain. So let's listen to some sounds that animals make. We heard the midshipmen before. They also make a grunting sound when they're trying to defend their nests. Let's listen to that sound. The funny sound. Do you hear it? I bet you can grunt like that too. And we have frogs that make croaking sounds when they want to attract a female. And we have birds that sing. 
sing when they want to defend their territories or attract a mate. That's the sound you know, right? But it's hard to make that sound. It's very beautiful. And here's a squirrel monkey and the sound it makes. So there are all these different animals that are related to each other. That's why they're on this evolutionary tree. And it turns out that their centers in the brain that control sound actually are all in the same place early in development. And that's what we figured out as scientists. And that's really exciting. So we know that the plain mid the plain fin midshipman is a singing fish, and that's really, really cool. But there's so many other ways that this fish is super cool, and I want to tell you about that. So in the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to convince you that this is the coolest species of all, because I want to win the way cool competition, and I'm going to tell you why this fish is super, super cool. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research team and the kinds of things we do to collect data as scientists on this species. And then I'm going to tell you maybe a few things about some of the exciting results we've found out so far. And I'll wrap up with some take home messages. And also, I'll, of course, be really, really happy to take your questions. So let's start off with why I think this is such a cool species. So I told you already, the first fun fact was that they hum or sing. And the second cool fact was that they do so, the males do so to attract females. And the cool fact number three is about how they get their name. So every time I give a talk, people say, why are they called that funny name? Why are they called plain fin midshipmen? Why do they have that name? And it turns out that they have this name because of the 700 and more light emitting cells that they have on their tummies all over their bodies, but really mostly on their tummies. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. They have lots of these. And the first people to see these light emitting cells called photophores thought they looked a lot like Navy officers midshipman uniforms, like the, the, the shiny button on a midshipman uniform. Well, why do they need these light emitting cells? Really weird. This is a fish that at, during the day spends all its time buried in the ground, in sand, in mud, all through the day. So why do they need these light emitting cells? Well, it all has to happen. It all happens at night. At night, they come off the seabed and they start looking for prey. And they're actually ambush predators, which means they sneak up to their prey and they grab them. And they do so with light. So they use these funky cells, these neat light emitting cells, to capture prey. Many of their prey are zooplankton that they are also light emitting. And we think that that's how they produce these light these lights in their photophores by eating these critters that also produce light. And um, the prey is attracted to these light cells, and they come, and that's when the midshipmen eat them. But we also think that these light emitting cells help the fish get away from predators. And the way they do that is that if a predator is chasing them, they can flash them really, really quickly and scare the predator a little bit, and maybe have a little bit of time to get away. We also think that if you look at this fish from the bottom, you don't see a fish shape. You see a bunch of weird shapes that are broken up by light. So a predator from the bottom doesn't necessarily see this fish. And that's called a kind of camouflage or counter illumination, we call it. So it also helps them avoid predators from the bottom. So midshipmen are dead common. Bob here, my new friend, told me he's never seen one. How many of you in the audience think you've seen one before? OK, quite a few. They're super, super common. You see them all the way from Alaska down to Baja, California. They're a very common fish. And if you go out onto the rocky shores right here outside of Vancouver, you will see them. Um, but you won't see them all through the year. For eight months of the year, they live in very, very deep waters, 200, 300 feet, meters deep. You won't see them at all. But then around April, 
they make what we call a vertical migration. They move from the deep parts of the ocean into the shallowest part of the ocean. They come right up to the intertidal zone where you and your friends can find them if you simply turn over rocks on a rocky intertidal beach in British Columbia. So here's one of the beaches that we work on, um, Crescent Beach. I bet lots of you know this beach. Um, and I circled one of the rocks in red. And that's because in April, the first fish to arrive are the males, and they hunker down under a rock. Each male takes a rock to make its nest. And I've turned over one because that just simply shows you one nest. But this picture really gives you a good impression of why we love to work with them. It's super convenient. I don't have to put on scuba gear. I don't even have to wear my fins and snorkel. I can just walk along the beach and turn over rocks and study fish without getting that wet. So that's really neat. But there's another thing that's really cool about them. Their nests are clustered. On this one beach in Crescent Beach, there might be 300 nests. I don't have to get into my Land Rover and drive a mile away to study the next midshipman nest. It's right next door. So this beach will have hundreds of nests. And each male doesn't just come to a nest. It chooses a rock, and it makes a special burrow. It excavates that burrow. Um, and it wants to do a really, really good job making a nest. Here's a midshipman with a mouthful of debris, of shells. Let's watch this in, on a video. Let's see if this works. Of course it won't because, oh, come on, you can do it. So this funny little fish is actually changing the structure underneath the rock and making it a beautiful home for itself. Because it has to live there for a long time. And remember, it has to attract females. It has to make a really nice home where the sound is going to sound beautiful and the females are going to want to come and lay their eggs. It turns out that big midshipmen can sing much longer and louder than little midshipmen. And Females really, really like the midshipmen that sing loud and long. <laughs> and if they really like a male, they'll lay their 200 eggs in his nest. So here are some tiles. We often use tiles in our research as artificial nests because they're really convenient. But here's a little, probably a little midshipman. I don't know for sure. But this male only received maybe one female's eggs that night. Here's a nest where the male was probably singing loud and probably singing long because seven, maybe even eight females decided to lay their precious eggs in this male's nest. So we know all of this, and that's great. But the minute the female has laid her eggs, she takes off. She goes back to sea and has a good time till next year, but not the poor males. The poor males have to guard the eggs, and they guard the eggs for up to four months. That's a long time. That's a long time for a fish. That's a long time even for me to babysit my kids. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of care. Now, we know that these baby fish take a long time to develop. It takes each baby fish 60 days before it's ready to go out to the ocean, to swim on its own and go out into the ocean. So um, there's a lot of different development that has to happen. At first, the eggs are just big blobs of yellow goo, yolk. But very soon, you be, you're able to see heads and spinal cords and even little eyes popping out. And after 60 days, they no longer have an egg, yeah, so, um, egg sac. Their yolk is completely absorbed, and they're little fish that can go out into the ocean. But the dads get lots and lots of females at different times, all through the season. So in one nest, there can be baby fish that are ready to go out to sea and baby fish that have just been laid. So here's a nest with some eggs and also some fry young juvenile fish that are just about to go out to sea. So the dad has to stay and watch these younger babies. And what happens is that the dads come in at the beginning of April, 
all healthy and fit and fat and with lots of muscle. And by the end, they're really skinny and they're hungry and they're thin and they're not very, very happy anymore. Because looking after young takes a lot of energy and a lot of time. And any of us who are parents will know this is true. And it's true for midshipmen, too. So how do we know this as scientists? Like, what do we know that makes this true? We weigh the fish. We bring out scales to the beaches. And we put the fish in this, on the scale. And we weigh them. And then we reweigh them. And we reweigh them. And what you can see here is the body condition, or how fat they are given their body size, um, in May, in June, and July. And you can see the body condition is going down. These are called box plots. And they tell us that there's a decrease in the overall condition over the breeding season. And we can also take little bits of tissue and find out how much fuel the fish have. We can look in the blood, and we can look in the liver, and we can figure out how much fuel, how, many, how much glucose and glycogen and proteins the fish have. And these also are going down over the season. So in May, there's lots of these energy stores. In June, there's less. In July, there's even less. And we experimentally starved some fish and saw that their energy stores were really quite low by the end of the season. So dads do it all. <laughs> dads do all the caring in this um, species. And I just told you that it takes dads a lot of time and a lot of energy to look after their young. But that's not all the dads have to do. They also have to avoid predators. And so actually looking after the babies is very dangerous. Why? Because eagles and herons and gulls and crows and Bears love midshipmen. We've even seen a link. Wherever we find midshipmen beaches, we see eagles. So we think that the eagles, it's a really important food source for them. And the caring dads, they, they get just hammered by these predators. The predators come and they take them. And maybe in some of my pictures, you've also noticed something else that's a little weird. I told you how I don't have to get wet when I'm walking along. Well, these fish are hardly wet, too, because when the tide recedes and there's a low tide, they're staying in very small amounts of water, sometimes completely dry nests. And this is an extreme condition for the caring males. Sometimes for up to eight hours at low tide, these guys are out of water looking after their babies. Here's a nest. Here's another nest. See how little water there is? Of course, the tide will come back. But for about you know, four hours, five hours, depending on the beach, sometimes even eight hours, these males are out of water dealing with this extreme environment. OK, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research team. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do to collect data as scientists, how we do this. Because um, you're probably wondering how scientists do what they do. So, um, this is my research team. These are the main principal kind of engines of research um, on my team. Dr. John Fitzpatrick started the project with me a long time ago. He's now a professor at Manchester University. And with him, I studied midshipman sperm because I'm going to tell you in a minute, their sperm is really, really weird and wonderful too. Karen Cogliotti is now uh, 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 has a position at Oregon State University. And she was a PhD student of mine as well. And with her, we studied how environments change over time and across space and how that influences the breeding biology of these wonderful, crazy midshipmen fish. And Anish Bose is my current PhD student on the project. He's going to come out here in April, and we're going to start working together. And Anish is really interested in this costly care and how the animals might be adapted to this care. And he's even interested in cannibalism, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But each of these students has been helped by tons and tons and tons of people. Lay people, uh, researchers at the university, undergraduates. We can't do it alone. And this is just to tell everybody that when you do research, especially in the field, it's usually a group effort. You're usually working with big groups of people. So if you like that, you might really like research at a university. Um, so 
what are the questions we want to answer? We want to know how these animals deal with this really, really costly care. We want to know how environments change over time and space and how that affects their breeding biology. Like you guys all know that at the beginning of the spring, things are very different than at the end of the fall. And we want to know how that influences the biology of these fishes because they're breeding for a long time, for four months. And you guys also know that environments change, right? Like food and shelter can be much more dense or much more sparse at different, in different places. And so we study these fish all the way up uh, in British Columbia and all the way down in California and in between. We try to understand how their biology differs depending on the environments that they encounter. And finally, we're also really um, excited about trying to understand how our own species is impacting this species. So what are the things that we do, like we build a marina or um, a paint factory or we have a bit of an oil spill? How, does, how do those activities influence the biology and the population dynamics of the midshipman fish? And so that's what we do. Those are the questions that we, an we try to answer. And how do we do this? Well, we find beaches where we've heard that there are midshipmen, or we find midshipmen ourselves, and we know they're there. And we lay something called a transect line. It's basically just a long line that you lay along the shore. In our case, there it's about 100 uh, meters long. And then every 10 meters along this line, we put down a quadrant, which is basically a big square. In our case, we use a two and a half by two and a half square, and we map everything in this square. Every 10 meters along the transect line, at one site, we figure out what's there. We turn over rocks, we map up what organisms are there. Do you have a question? Why do you do that? Why do I do that? That's a great question. I do that so I know what the midshipmen like and what they don't like. Maybe I'm going along and I find no midshipmen, no midshipmen, no midshipmen, no midshipmen, and that tells me this is a bad area for them or I might go along and I might find lots of them. And so that, this method allows me to figure out how many midshipmen there are in a particular area. Whenever we find a nest, we mark that nest. And we mark it with a tent peg. We number the tent peg and we hammer it into the ground. And then we can revisit that nest time and time and time again. There's a picture of Karen and myself looking at a nest and seeing if it's the same guy who's still in the nest. To know for sure it's the same males or females or whatever, we have to mark the fish. And we do so with a kind of tattoo ink called elastomere, which lasts on the fish. And we put it in a very special place on the dorsal fin. Here's a fish that's being marked. We can put it in many different locations on the body, and we can use lots of different colors. And we can create lots of unique tags. So every fish has their own special tattoo. And I know who each fish is and where they came from. And I can check if the male is there time in and time out. We also examine each nest really, really carefully. We measure the eggs. We count them. We look at what other critters are there and so on. And like I told you, we love to measure things. So we measure them on a scale. We measure them with the ruler. We want to know how big the fish are. And we also want to find out who is the real, who are the real parents. So we do something called a genetic analysis. We scrape off some eggs off the rock, and we take a little bit of thin tissue that grows again. Within two weeks, the fish have that little bit of tissue back right off their tails. And we pop that in a little tube, and we fill it up with ethanol. Here I'm going to show you a tube full of baby fish. And we have a little bit of dad tissue. And we do what we call a, a microsatellite analysis. It's a molecular test that allows us to tell who's the dad and who's the mom of these baby fish. So Luke and Leah are Darth Vader's kids because they share special molecular marks. And we do the same kind of tests on these fish. Here's another example of that. We're basically looking for special peaks that tell us that this kid really belongs to that mother and to this father because they share special um, genetic um, markers. 
And finally, we also measure contaminant burdens. So we take blood, we take tissues, and we try to figure out how much contaminants are in these um, organisms. Now remember, the fish come from really deep in the ocean, and they come all the way to the shallow zones of our oceans, the intertidal. So it's easy to sample them, but they cover a very wide spectrum of space. And so they're great markers for us of what might be going on in our oceans. So I'm going to tell you about a few of our very exciting results. I told you that caring for these fish is really, really costly. The fish lose weight. They have no more energy. They have, may have been hammered by predators. They've taken four months out of their lives to raise babies. What can they do? What can you do when you have this really costly care? One of the things that's, that scientists think happens sometimes, they think that animals might eat a few of their babies, a few of their eggs, just to replenish some energy source so, so that they can continue to care or make it till the next year. So that's called cannibalism, and it's thought to maybe replenish energy sources. And we wondered if the midshipmen were maybe having a little snack so that they could care for a long, long period of time. Do you have a question? Why do you need to make a square? Why do I need to make a square? Oh, because a square is easy to measure. It's easier to measure than a circle. So it helps us with measuring what's in the square. So here you can see uh, that males are definitely eating some of their eggs. They do eat their eggs. And in fact, lots of them eat a little bit of their eggs. In May, 60%, nearly 60% of our, the fish we sampled are cannibalizing. In June, that drops down to about a quarter, about 27% are cannibalizing. And at the end of the season, in July and August, there's no cannibalism. Here you can see some eggs that came out of a tummy of one of the midshipmen. So they are definitely eating some of their eggs. But the question is, are they eating eggs to replenish the, the energy that they've lost because they've been working so hard looking after their babies? Are they having a little snack because caring for all of those eggs takes up so much energy? And the answer that we've come up with so far is no, because when they cannibalize is early in the season. So you can see in the dark bars here the percentage of the fish that are cannibalizing, and the light bars are those that are not cannibalizing. And you can see that cannibalism drops off. So they're eating fewer and fewer eggs as the season progresses, but that's exactly when their energy stores are diving down. So they're eating when their energy stores are highest, and they're not eating when they're lowest. And we're doing some experiments along this line as well. OK, what else can an animal do so that it doesn't have to do all that really, really costly caring for young? Well, one thing you can do is you can steal someone's nest. They built this beautiful nest that's going to make a beautiful sound and attract lots of females. Maybe you can just go and steal it, and then you don't have to build your own house. So this is called a takeover, and we wondered if the fish were taking over nests in order to save energy. To take over, you have to compete. And competition in animals is really, really common. Males compete all the time. Some females even compete. But males compete all the time for resources for resources like females or for things that females want, like food or territories. And it's really, really common. And ever since Darwin's day, we've recognized that this kind of competition is really widespread across all kinds of animals. And midshipmen compete, too. And they compete for nests. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a fight. You'll see two fish fighting after my bad videos. Uh, you can see two fish wrestling. And they're fighting. Let's watch that again. Did you see the two fish kind of with their mouths on each other and really fighting against each other, pushing and shoving? And they're just at each other. And these two fish can poke each other with their spines and cause all kinds of injury. And eventually, one will win and the other will lose. And the loser gets tossed out of the nest and the other one gets the nest. 
And there are special sounds that these fish make when they're fighting. These are called uh, aggressive vocalizations. I want you to hear some of these. means a midshipman's really mad. Here's a growl. If you hear that when you're trying to handle one of these midshipmen, you better watch out because they're about to bite you. They're going to be in a really, they're in a fighting mood if they're making those sounds. So um, big males can take nests away from small males. And we call these males that take over a nest, takeover males. There's the original carrying male. We marked him the next day. After seeing the two males fighting, we saw that the bigger guy at the top had the nest. And just like cannibalism, these takeovers happen early in the season. Lots and lots of them early in May, fewer in June, and none at all in July. What else might a male do so it doesn't have to do all that costly caring? <coughs> it can do something called sneaking. So there are these sneaky males that don't care at all. All they do is they dash into the nest, spray their sperm, fertilize the eggs, and take off, leaving some other guy to look after the baby. So that's a great way of avoiding parental care. Don't do it. Um, and that's exactly what happens in these fish. So here we have a nest. We have some baby fish. We have a big parental male. We have a female who likes him very much because he's so big and he makes such beautiful sounds. And we have a little tiny sneaker male. And these sneaker males, they stay on the side. They're very sneaky. You can't always see them because they're so little. Look at how little they are. They're so little, they couldn't push this guy out of the nest. So they have to find some other way to reproduce. And that's exactly what they do. Here they are side by side. We have these little sneaker males, and we have the big guarding males. There are two types of males in this species. So how do they differ? Well, the big guarding males, they build the nests, they court females. They care for the young, and the little sneaker males do none of that. They sneak into the nest, they, and they quickly leave after leaving their sperm behind. Um, and whenever we see that there are two kinds of uh, males in a species, scientists call the, this a species with alternative reproductive tactics, which means that there are two kinds of animals that are uh, trying to achieve reproduction using very different ways, very different methods. So in the rhinoceros beetles, we have two kinds of males. We have the major males with these big, huge horns. And we have the minor males who don't have any horns at all. And these major males, they fight each other. And the, the ones that win have access to the tunnels that females come and lay their eggs in. But these minor males, they don't even fight. What they do is they build tunnels into the female tunnels from the side. They sneak in. They mate with the females. And then they run off, never fighting these big males. So there are these very different ways of getting reproduction. And we now know that all across the animal kingdom, um, there are different types of males that achieve reproduction in different ways. There are sneaker males and what we call conventional males, or courting males, or guarding males. So when we went out and we looked at the guarding males and we looked at the sneaker males, we found that the Guarding males were much, much bigger. They weigh about 120 grams each. And the sneaker males are only about 15 grams. And these guys have big sonic muscles that attract the females because they vibrate their swim bladders really, really fast. And these guys have very, very small swim um, sonic muscles because they don't need to attract females. They're quiet. They don't want anyone to know that they're there. We also opened up the fish, and we looked at their testes, where they make their sperm. And we found that the guarding males have much smaller testes than do the sneaker males. They actually have almost the same size testes in absolute terms. But remember, this testes is in a much smaller fish. So much more of its body is put into making these testes that make sperm. 
And because we have a special machine in my lab called Sperm Tracker, we were actually able to measure how fast the swim, the, how fast the sperm swim in these two different kinds of males. And this is John, and that's what he's doing. And he also measured very carefully everything about these sperm and asked, are they different in the two different kinds of males? So the first thing that made us really sit up and notice is that unlike most fish sperm, which has a round head and one long tail, these fish had two tails on their sperm. Not one tail, but two tails. See the two tails? There's one tail. There's another tail on the sperm. And the sperm head wasn't round. It was squiggly and long. So what we do know is that the garter males have these really big sperm heads. And that's where the DNA is kept, where the genetic material that makes you you is kept. And we know that they have really small engines or mid-pieces, the ATP-rich area of the sperm that's the mid piece is really small in these garter males. And they have these two tails. We know that sneakers also have two tails, but they have really big engines with lots and lots of ATP in this mid piece, in this fueling area of the sperm that makes the sperm swim really fast. And they have small heads. So maybe that's why these different dynamics of the characters of the sperm make them swim differently because they do swim differently. Look at this. If I play you what an average guarding sperm, um, sperm from an average guarding male looks like, it looks something like this on the sperm tracker. Kind of chilled, laid back sperm. They've all been to Hawaii and they're very relaxed. Or maybe this is what a sneaker sperm sample looks like. And they're moving really, really fast. They're the New Yorkers of the sperm world. They're moving fast. So I'm going to play that again, and you can see the slowness versus the fastness. So sneaker sperm is moving really, really fast on our sperm trackers, and the guarding male's sperm is very, very much slower. So we know that sneakers have faster sperm, but does that mean that they have more babies? Probably not. Turns out that when we did our paternity analysis and tried to figure out how many of the dads were really the dads of the babies they were looking after, we were shocked because it was only about 50%. Only 50% of the babies in the nest belonged to the dad that was providing the parental care. That really surprised us. But it turned out it wasn't really the sneakers that were stealing all this fertilization, that were stealing all this paternity away from the guarding males. Turned out it was much more likely to be the takeover males. So if you look here, there's some males that are looking after 100% of their babies. All of the babies in their nest belong to them. And then there's some guys who are looking after none of their own babies, probably because they just took over that nest. So let's sort of wrap everything up. What do I want you to go home with and remember? I want you to tell everybody, the midshipmen, are way, way, way cool. And I think they're cool because they sing, they hum, they use light cells to attract their prey and deter their predators. They tolerate long, long periods out of the water. They're used to extreme environments. They care for their babies for four months. That's a long time for a fish. That's a long time for anything. And there's also two kinds of males. There are good dads, and then there's ca there are cads. They have two-tailed sperm. And some males take over the nests of other males. And some males even eat young. So you might be scratching your head and saying, so why should I care about all of this? Dr. Balshine Seagal is saying that, that this is all very cool. That's all great. Why should you care? Well, you should care because this is a species that's a great sentinel species. It moves from the deepest part of our oceans to the most shallowest parts of our oceans. And they're part of an important food web. Things like dolphins and sharks and eagles eat them. If they have healthy um, populations, then the food web is also going to be in good shape. They're modifiers of our intertidal zone. They make space for other organisms. Remember I showed you that video where they moved away shells and debris? They're creating space for things like mussels and barnacles and, and uh, starfish. Now the starfish are under 
um, a dark cloud with this wasting disease, what's going to happen to midshipmen? It's an interesting question and one that our research group hopes to answer. And also, I told you about these two different kinds of males in the population. There are lots and lots of commercially important fisheries, like salmon fisheries, where these alternative reproductive tactics exist. A lot of salmon, for example, have jacks and hook noses. So you know, when we don't ignore that part of the biology, it's to our own detriment. Lots of times, modelers of fisheries um, dynamics only worry about females and how many eggs they have. But we have to think about the males, too. And so I, we hope to contribute to this discussion. So finally, I'm just going to end with what you guys can do, because you can do stuff. Um, I think everyone should become a midshipman beach ambassador. Drag your moms and dads, drag your babysitters, drag your cousins, go to a beach. If you're an adult without kids, go yourself to a beach. Take your dog, take your friend, and let us know if you find a midshipman or their eggs, because we are looking for new sites, and it's important for us to get fine scale detail on where they might be. I also want everybody to try to figure out if they can do a little bit of inventory, figure out how to do a biodiversity inventory. It's really easy. There are YouTube videos. I can teach you. But if you notice changes, especially declines, you need to contact someone. You need to tell Environment Canada or the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, if your local areas are in decline, we need to know. Um, and you can support political efforts to conserve our coastline. So we have the longest coastline of any country in the world. Um, we have very few protected areas, marine protected areas. We need to advocate for more aquatic reserves, more marine protected areas. Um, and with that, I'm just going to say thank you. And I'm going to say thank you especially to many, many people who've supported my project in various ways. Um, so my parents store my gear here from year to year. Thank you, mom and dad. They let students crash. A lot of local landowners have let us access their lands or even sleep in their summer homes. And I appreciate all of that. And Jen, who's here in the audience, has taken some of the beautiful pictures that you've seen. She comes out each year with our group and takes wonderful photographs. So thank you for coming. And thanks to all these wonderful people. And I am going to be so happy to tell you about midshipmen, answer your questions. Here's a sneaker male. Here's a parental male. Come and see them.